All righty. Um, well, welcome everyone to Saturday morning. Uh, today I'm going to talk um, just uh, sort of very generally, I suppose, about graphs and networks. Um, so it's a little bit sort of tutorially, um, I suppose, but uh, I'm quite happy to break the traditional mold of me talking and you listening. And um, so please feel free to heckle and interrupt and ask questions as I go. Um, it's probably a little bit easier that way than trying to save them all up for the end. So I am from, uh, from beautiful downtown Canberra, which is quite a bit chillier this time of year. Um, but so what, uh, what I really want to talk about is this, you know, we, this general concept of graphs and networks that sort of they're very pervasive in our life and they actually cover you know, many, many areas that we probably don't um, you know, generally think about them. So you know, my world's typically energy and so there's lots of obviously energy networks in terms of all the poles and wires um, that deliver um, energy to us. And maybe that's something that we, we tend to see um, more often. But networks and sort of the graphs that describe networks also come into the tiniest building blocks of life. So, you know, biological networks in terms of how our cells interact, how um, proteins are formed and things like that form another really, really important um, area of life and science that we can actually understand through looking at graphs. So this is actually a, um, a, a protein graph, I believe. It's not, uh, not my area of specialty. But graphs are also pervasive in computing too. And um, for those of you who've um, been through probably CS degrees, you know, graph theory is hugely important in understanding um, processes and concurrency and things like that. So I stole this um, unashamedly off the internet, but this is actually the, a graph that's produced from, um, uh, from a Python library called PyCall graph. And all it's doing is it's actually looking at the execution graph um, of a piece of software in Python. So again, we have these um, recurrent structures of networks. Taking a slightly different tack, this is actually uh, a graph that describes um, it's a graph of the internet in its entirety that was done in 2005. So um, down here, it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit murky, but you can actually see IP addresses here. And so they uh, this this project was actually scanning the internet um, over a significant period of time to build this graph um, of how of how the internet um, globally is is connected. And so it gives you some interesting insights just in terms of these things that exist all around us that perhaps we don't we, we use but we may not necessarily appreciate the complexity that's there and you know if this doesn't uh, if this doesn't give you a sense of that then I'm not sure what would this is another graph um, that describes the global flight patterns um, of aircraft and so again you can see this huge amount of complexity here that we don't appreciate when we go to the airport and hop on a plane from, you know, from one place to another. But globally and simultaneously, there are you know, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of flights. And trying to actually understand the structure of this is something that we can begin to investigate by looking at um, graphs and networks. And finally, um, I actually stumbled across this tool, which uh, unfortunately I got to the other day and it's about to be taken down as of the 1st of August, but uh, it was a cool LinkedIn lab that actually showed you, allowed you to visualize your social network on, uh, on LinkedIn. And it was really interesting for me because obviously you get all these random connections from, from all over the place and you always just tend to think of them as these point to point connections that you have with people because of, you know, you've worked with them or you know them or you know, they've randomly stalked you on the internet. <laughs> but the thing that was interesting to me was that there's all this structure that I didn't understand about the people in my own network. So, you know, all this colouring was actually done automatically. And so, you know, this, this lab allowed me to say, oh, cool, well, you know, that green area, that green area actually represents sort of my involvement in startups and the people I know through startups. And it was really interesting to see the structure that existed within that network. Um, and then I just have this random network of people over here who just have no relation to anybody else I know. <laughs> oh, so um, 
so this is uh, doesn't use a distance based graph to the best of my knowledge so it's a, the connections represent connections on LinkedIn um, but the actual connection distance is just uh, is just representative of the layout that they've used so um, yeah so this one's it's just a connection graph there's no the, the distance isn't um, isn't proportional to anything So we've seen all these really cool kind of graph structures and you get some really awesome visualizations um, of stuff. Um, but at a very, at a very low level, um, graphs are actually really, really simple to understand and they're actually really simple to analyze as well. So this is what we're going to spend the majority of the talk talking about. Um, and there's heaps of uh, sample code in here at a very basic level. So I'm hopefully not insulting anybody's intelligence here, but I think if you've never come across graphs, um, and particularly if you've never come across graphs in Python, um, this will be a really good introduction, but I'd encourage you to take from this the fact that it's a really exciting um, opportunity to do this kind of analysis and there are heaps and heaps of um, further resources on the internet which are really, really useful. So graphs, as I said, are pretty simple. They come, they have two sets of things. They have a set of vertices or nodes and they have a set of edges that connect those nodes. All right, and they typically get written like this, G equals VE, so all my nodes and the edges that connect my nodes. And then there's two fundamental types of graphs um, that we think about. There's undirected graphs, which you can see in the middle here, and undirected graphs just, they show a relationship, but they don't show anything else. They don't show if there's any flow or the direction of a relationship. And then we have directed graphs at the top, and directed graphs um, do have direction. So, you know, they might be representative of a flow of something. So, you know, in the energy network, a directed graph might show the direction of flow um, of energy. So these are the two fundamental building blocks um, of graphs. Now, in Python, um, there is an awesome library um, called NetworkX. Um, so there was an excellent question yesterday as to why NetworkX versus uh, <laughs> any other library. There are other libraries that have, um, other graph libraries that have Python bindings. Um, but my understanding is that they are not all native Python in the same way that NetworkX is. Um, and from my uh, experimentation and whatnot, I found NetworkX to be just, it's a, just a, it's a beautiful library, it's well written, it supports all of the methods um, and capabilities that you'd expect um, if you're coming from the, you know, the world of graphs. Um, it's also very, very quick and a lot of the um, algorithms are implemented at a much, much lower level outside of Python so that it's, uh, it's actually quick to run on big graphs and you'll see some of that uh, as we go through. So the really nice thing about NetworkX is that nodes can be anything that's hashable. So any object you want um, can be used to represent a node. So it can be a string, it can be um, a number, it can be a Python object. So it's really flexible in terms of how you build it. Uh, and then edges are just tuples of nodes. So um, in an undirected graph, the nodes don't have um, any meaning, but in a directed graph, obviously, the first part of the tuple is the source node and the second part of the tuple is the, uh, the sync node where it's going. And it's a really well-maintained package, so it's been around now for about 12 years, um, and they're constantly updating it, and the documentation for it is absolutely fantastic. So we should start by actually making a graph. So we can import network X. Um, we're going to use this plotting part in a moment for all the visualizations that you'll see. Uh, and we're just going to start with a simple undirected graph. And so we've set up our graph here. Ooh. Then we can go and add some nodes. And in this case, I've been really creative and numbered them from one to five. Then we can add some edges. And so again, the edges are just from two. So you can probably look at that and work out roughly um, what the network should look like but we don't have to do that because we can actually visualize it. So um, network X has a bunch of draw methods. Um, and if I have one criticism of the library, it's that the, the layout algorithms that they use are absolutely horrendous. And um, I mean that with no, without being too mean, but because layout is actually a really, really hard problem to solve, especially in larger graphs. Um, but as you'll see in a bit for some of these, it's, you just can't force network X to give you some pretty visualizations, but there are workarounds that mean you can get the data out to actually use uh, visualization tools that have different layout algorithms. So hopefully this graph that you see here should correspond with what we set up over there 
um, and I'm pretty confident that it does. And now we can do exactly the same thing um, with the directed graph. So the difference you'll notice is that when we've declared our graph now, we've called it digraph, so directed graph. Um, the other thing you'll notice here is that in the previous example, I put my nodes in one at a time. But you don't have to, you don't have to do that um, with Network X. You can actually add nodes in bulk. So we've just got a list, we add all our nodes, we add exactly the same edges, and we get our graph. And this time, you'll notice that we have the arrows that actually show the direction of flow. And that corresponds, obviously, to the ordering um, that we put into the, uh, into the edges there. But the other thing you can do with Network X is you actually don't have to declare nodes explicitly. All right? And so um, you'll see in the example I do later that uh, declaring nodes is really just a little bit over the top if you don't need to do it. Because once the edges get put in, the nodes are automatically inserted. Okay? So that's all you need to do and then you can, uh, you can plot away. So when you start with this kind of library, you start with some really basic graphs like this. Um, you know, they give you some, something to visualize and something to talk about. But in reality, when it comes to graph theory, we're actually probably trying to use the graph to actually solve a problem in some way, shape, or form. And the nice thing about Network X is, um, unlike a lot of uh, libraries where you have all these really cool tools, but you don't have nothing to do with them, Network X actually supports creating um, some standard graph structures that you can use to start playing around with the library or start doing some analytics um, or start doing some research. And so, you know, this, this library actually spans something that's actually immensely useful all the way from um, just a visualization of how things are structured and how they're related all the way through to doing, you know, sort of cutting edge research in terms of, uh, you know, how networks relate to social, uh, you know, social interaction um, through data provenance um, and even into data analytics as well. So I'd like to just take you through some of the graphs that Network X can produce um, just to give you a sense of its versatility and, and hopefully too that if, if this is something that interests you, you can actually get in there straight away and start playing around um, with some of these examples. So we'll start with two boring ones um, and we'll rapidly move to a couple more interesting. So you can do complete graphs and barbell graphs, which look a little bit something like this. So this is the complete graph. So it has um, a connection from every node to every other node, and then a barbell graph, which looks a little bit like a barbell. Um, you can see the beauty of the layout engine at the top of that barbell graph, where it's decided that it's better for them all to cross over rather than just having a straight line. Um, and now we're going to get into three three graphs that have been have actually um, been really influential in in sort of graph theory world in terms of how people actually analyze them. So there's this graph called the Erdos Renyi graph, um, and it might seem strange to some of you that people would get all super excited about algorithms for for um, for producing graphs. But the problem with um, with all things is that if you don't have samples out of something that you want to measure, you need a way to produce something automatically that allows you to do some research to understand structure. And so these three graphs that I'm going to talk about are three graphs that have been really influential in underpinning how research in graphs and how, the, like how those graphs are structured um, has progressed since the, basically since the end of the 50s when this, this graph first um, was, or this, the algorithm for producing this first was um, discovered, I suppose. So the erdos renyi graph gives you a random graph. So you sprinkle some nodes down, and then between all of those nodes, you have some probability that those nodes are going to be connected to each other. And for those of you who are Bayesian um, statisticians, the probability of interconnection between any two nodes is identical and totally independent of any other connection. So it basically means that you get, from sprinkling your nodes, you then get a random selection of connections between those nodes. Network X makes that really, really easy. So the, uh, the call here that sets that up is you're actually specifying how many nodes you want and then the probability of interconnection between any two nodes. And then we can draw it again. And here we can see the absolute delight of visualization again. Um, and I do apologize for this, but uh, the, the underlying graphs are really what's of interest here. So there's 100 nodes here and 
they're all randomly connected. And so in certain instances, this is going to be a really useful graph for people um, to start looking at. Now, the thing that we don't have time to cover today is the many, many, many algorithms that um, NetworkX has in its uh, library. But once you start playing with these graphs and you go and start checking out different graph properties, so the dimension of the graph, so how wide the graph is or how connected all these nodes are, you start to see all those properties fall out for each of these graphs. So that's why I'm talking about them. So this is the random graph. Then we move to a graph called the watt strogatz graph. Um, and it produces graphs that they call, it's called small world properties, but it actually is a graph that kind of defines, kind of describes how communities um, of people know each other and how we're all connected. So when you talk, when you hear about people talking about the six degrees of separation, that was sort of a, I suppose, more, more philosophical construct than anything else. But when you do, when you have a look at these small world networks, you actually see that sort of six degrees of separation globally starting to fall out. So these are graphs that describe um, human social networks really, really well. Um, and again, Network X makes that really, really easy um, to, to produce. So you can produce it this way, and then you get this. And you notice here that it has quite a different, even, you know, even with it being visualized like this, it has quite a different structure. Um, and within this, you would find lots of little clicks. So there would be groups of people that are really tightly meshed together that have very loose connections to other groups of people. And if you think about communities and society, that's exactly how we are connected. So this is a great model for, um, for that kind of stuff. And the last model I'll talk about is a model called the Barabasi-Albert model. And uh, this one's been really, really influential um, because this one actually describes things like how the internet's connected and how uh, you know, power networks are connected. So it's what's called a scale-free network. And so scale-free networks are just networks that have, they have over all of the, you know, the nodes that are within a network, they have a very, very different degree distribution. So the degree is how many connections you have at each node. And in a scale-free network, you have a very, very small number of nodes that are really highly connected. Okay, so if you think about this in sort of the internet, um, then you have, what that's saying is, is you have a small number of nodes that are really, really well connected. So they're your data center type nodes. You know, they're well connected to everything else that's around them. But then you have this really long tail. You have heaps of nodes that only have one or two connections. And in the internet, that's all of us in our homes. We, you know, we don't have, or short of having server farms in our houses, but you know, we, don't laugh actually, I was speaking to a guy the other day who said he needs to burn off some extra energy from his solar panels and was actually contemplating setting up a server farm that he could run during the day to use extra energy. So it's not, it's not as quite as crazy as it sounds. Um, but you have all these, you have, you know, typically in our houses we have just one connection and that connection's back, you know, through our ISP to the wider internet. And so we're that very long tail, of very, we're very poorly connected. Um, and so the, the uh, when you, when I showed you that, uh, the diagram of the internet map before, that's a scale-free network. And you can go, oh, well, that's really interesting, but why do I care about that kind of stuff? But it's actually really, really important because when you start to look at, you know, uh, the operability of the internet and robustness and things like that, scale-free networks are actually, they tell you a lot about two concepts of robustness and fragility. And so robustness is something that comes from having things distributed. And so in a scale-free network like the internet, we kind of have that because we have everything distributed, okay? But the internet's also quite fragile because there's these hubs where connectivity is required, basically, to connect things together. And so while the internet, you know, works really, really well, you, you, you know, we've all seen the consequences of when you have major outages at data centers. So all of a sudden, you know, everybody's EC2 instance in a certain region stops responding. And so these scale-free networks were the first to really describe that robustness versus fragility. And so they're really, really interesting models. And again, Network X makes it really, really easy to produce, and you get graphs that look like this. Um, so I'll leave it to you to, uh, to pull the scale-free factors out of that. So that's sort of getting us to the point of uh, of having this, um, you know, an understanding of, I, I hope, an understanding and appreciation of the power of Network X. 
Um, what I thought I'd do now, sort of for the second half of the talk, is I'd like to just quickly run through an example of how you can use it. Um, you know, I'm going to pick social network analysis because it's interesting and there's a great data set that's out there to do this. Uh, and as we go through this, we'll talk about uh, you know, some of the other properties of graphs that you can use and some of the other uh, capabilities of Network X. Uh, and then there will, I guarantee, be plenty of time for questions um, and discussion at the end. So I'm going to use a data set from Enron. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Enron was a big energy company that had some suspicious accounting um, practices. So they, uh, they had a tendency to put profit into their books prior to actually making any profit, um, often before they'd built anything that could make profit. And uh, surprisingly, they went bankrupt. Um, and so when they went bankrupt in 2001, it was sort of this, you know, it was a f I suppose it was the first time we'd seen a really you know, massive company that was seen as a really good corporate citizen go pop in a major way. And so as the US investigators were sort of trawling through the history of, um, of this company, they decided that it might actually be a good idea to let the public at large see what was actually going on inside. So they released this corpus of emails, um, which is actually a super useful data set outside of network analysis for, you know, for natural language processing and things like that. And it's all online. So uh, I think it's hosted at, the, at a Carnegie Mellon site. Um, so you can go and grab all of those gigabytes and gigabytes of, uh, of emails that are meticulously arranged. So anyway, so you get all, you've got all these emails. So uh, uh, a friend of mine was actually um, working on this. He was indexing these in a search engine and I asked him to, um, to pull me out just a TSV file, so just a tab separated um, file of just the, the, the sender of the email and the recipient of the email. Um, and then there's a heap of other data about the email itself, but um, for what we're going to do today, I'm not, not particularly interested in that um, for what we're going to show. But uh, anyway, so you can, you can get a TSV file that, that looks a bit, a bit like this. So the sender, there's a single string in there of the sender's email address, and then the recipients, it's just um, it's a comma-separated set of strings of all the recipient email addresses. And I'd like to show you how we can pull this into Network X and then you know, hopefully do something useful with it. So we're going to start with a graph here. And I'm not so interested in this case in terms of you know, the direction of an email. I just want to know that an email sort of implies a relationship between two people in the company. And so we're going to start with an undirected graph, which is why we have just graph and not digraph. So then we're going to start to load the email data. So we're opening our TSV file. Um, and we've set up our reader as just a tab delimited, uh, tab delimited reader. And we're going to build our graph. And that's it. That's, that's the whole graph that's built in those, what is it, six, eight lines. Um, and when I first, this was actually the first thing I ever did in Network X. Um, and I was blown away by how quickly you could process um, you know, gigabytes. There's two, uh, there's about, there's between three to 500,000 um, emails, depending on the set of data that you have. Um, and so you've gone from a TSV file to a graph with 300,000 um, 300, emails and 80,000 recipients. Uh, and this runs on my two-year-old Mac uh, in about a second. So um, Network X certainly has the chops in terms of speed stuff. So anyway, so we've got our, um, we've read in the, the sender, we've split all our recipients up, and then for every recipient, we're just going to add an edge between the sender and the recipient. So that should all make sense. And now we're going to visualize it. And I'm not going to visualize this using the built-in tools, because while it takes a second to bring the data in, it, uh, it breaks my computer to try and visualize it using the built-in um, built Network X tool. So instead, we're going to just write it out to our graph file. In this case, we're using the GXF format. So another thing that Network X has is it's got really, really good support um, for exporting the data into many of the widely accepted um, graph storage formats. Uh, and in this case, I've chosen this format because I wanted to use a program called Gephi. And so this is, this is only a portion of the data set visualized. Um, Gephi has really good support for different layout algorithms and for filtering and screening and stuff like that. So when it comes time to presentation of results, um, this is actually not a particularly great example of what you can do with Gephi, but 
most of those um, examples that were shown earlier are using these kind of programs to um, to actually visualize them, to color them, um, to make them easy to understand. So you can see here, though, again, how there's little clusters here and there, and all these crazy interconnections, and all of this is now stored in you know in one object that we can start to play around with. So it's really cool to visualize it. But let's we actually want to do some practice, something practical with um, with that uh, visualization, or with the graph. So the first thing I thought we'd do is we might just check the node degree, um, and we'd have a look and see who has the highest degree of interconnections. Which, if you think about it in a company, is probably representative of people um, who are more, you know, quote unquote, interesting in the company. So um, Network X allows us to pull out the degree, the connection degree of all our uh, of all of our nodes. Um, I've just sorted them there so that we have the uh, the, the highest connections um, at you know one end of our um, of a of a list, and then this POI is just persons of interest. So I picked the top ten, so the the ten highest connected um, people within uh, within Enron from their uh, from their relationships from email. So you can see in here there's a bunch of names: T Tana and Jeff, um, Sally, Kenneth. Um, you know, Kenneth seems like an interesting guy because he has two email addresses for whatever reason. Um, and then, as you probably expect, there's a lot of people asking IT for help. Um, and interestingly, they seem to have a particular problem with Outlook, which should, <laughs> should come as no surprise to anybody. Um, and then there's also the dodgy one in here. You can see there's an empty string. So there's obviously stuff that, as we've pulled it out, um, there as you clean up some of these emails, there's, there's things that have obviously been corrupted over time, so they tend to just be replaced with the empty string. So that's why we have, there's that, the 10th one is this uh, anomalous one. So, but anyway, it's pretty easy for us to go through now and we can say, well, get rid of the empty string, it doesn't mean anything. We get rid of the Outlook team, we all know why they're being called so frequently. We get rid of the technology team, um, and we're gonna be left with seven names. And interestingly, these are the seven people that are left. So we've got the chairman who was indicted but died before going to jail. So they, 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 um, he didn't actually get convicted because you're apparently not allowed to be convicted. If you're not convicted while it's on appeal and then you die, you, apparently your conviction gets removed. Um, Jeff did go to jail though. Um, uh, yeah, Jeff Skilling. Um, and then these others. And you kind of look at this and you say, well, even just from something really, really simple, like looking at the connectivity with the rest of the organization, you know, you, you see that the, those people are actually relatively important. So, you know, from some simple analysis, we can pull out the fact that, you know, it's, it's easy to work out who these connected people are and see that they are the people that would be interesting. The next thing we might want to do is we're going to say, well, look, these people are interesting. Um, you know, what's the relationship that they have with one another? And from a, you know, from a corporate fraud perspective, actually, when, a, when auditors go into an organisation, the first thing that they want to understand is they want to understand, you know, what relationships are there that can give them some structure of trying to understand where they should be looking. And so if you think about this Enron corpus of emails, right, they, the auditors have gone in and then there's five years, maybe or more, of emails that need to be gone through so they get some poor first year lawyer to sit there reading through documents, trying to find incriminating details. Now, if you have to do that for every person in an organization, it starts to look kind of hard. So if you start with that thing, we've seen the most important people, let's assume that the CEO and the chairman might have some responsibility in terms of some interesting accounting practices. We now want to understand around them, who were they, you know, who were they in contact with and who did they have a relationship with? which might direct some further investigation. So in that list at the top, I just deleted the three that we talked about last slide. Um, and now we get to use this cool subgraph tool that NetworkX has. So obviously visualizing the previous graph was a total nightmare when you have all of the, you know, you have 100,000 nodes and 300,000, 400,000 edges. Um, but now we've got it down to seven nodes and we just want the interconnections between them and so we can call it a subgraph. And so subgraph just gives us the graph of the, of the nodes and, the, uh, and those edges that correspond between those nodes. And again, now we can go back to our beautiful Network X drawing tool, and this is the relationship that we get. 
And so this is kind of interesting too because we can see here that these people were relatively well connected. You know, there was a pretty strong relationship between this group at the top. And so, you know, if we were looking at uh, how they may have uh, collaborated in, uh, in their creative accounting practices, we might say, well, this is some, some, some strong evidence that these people were all talking to each other and all knew about it. Um, and then the outlier here is obviously that uh, Ken obviously didn't like to use this particular email address for collaboration. So, uh, but obviously his, uh, his other emails there and strongly connected to the other nodes. So when I said before that there were two types of graphs, directed and undirected, I was lying just a little bit. Um, but multigraphs are a convenient way um, of representing that there's multiple connections between two nodes. Um, and in sort of network and graph theory, they're actually not as widely used um, because they're a little bit harder to deal with analytically. So, but Network X supports multigraphs as well. And so the multigraph is quite simple. You just, when you're, when you're um, instantiating the object, you call multigraph rather than graph. And what multigraph means is that every time you add an edge to that, it stores it as a new edge, which is perfect if you're thinking about emails. All right, so we can add a new edge for every email. And actually, if we were bringing in our email data, we can now actually store that email, the contents of the email, on the edge itself because you can store properties in Network X on the edges. All right, so this is cool. So now, not only can we get all our nodes in place and understand what the relationships are, but we can actually start to use this as an investigative tool because for all of these emails, we can actually have a simple way of pulling out the emails between two people of interest um, or a group of people of interest. And then, you know, we looked at that with the relationships before just by doing some, you know, we were looking at the relationships that we had from actually pulling out uh, the series of people who are high, you know, most connected. But what we also might like to understand is what other relationships were formed between all of the groups um, of people within, within Enron. And so, you know, we can actually go and find out all of Ken's neighbours. So, you know, his neighbours are the people who are either sending him emails or um, receiving emails from him. And so Network X has these two methods. Neighbours actually just gives you a list of all of the neighbours. And there's also an iterator method, obviously. So when you're in big data sets like this, you want to take advantage of iterators so that you're not having to deal with lists that are thousands of, um, thousands of objects long, especially when you're dealing with thousands of objects for all of the 80 or 90,000 nodes that you might have in your network. Uh, and the final tool which I'll talk about here um, is this concept of a click. And I mentioned it before. And a click is just, it's a subgraph that's completely connected. Okay, so. You know, you think about um, your family and you typically would be completely connected to your family in some way in that you, you know, hopefully you know them all and there's some relationship between all of you, okay? Which is different to obviously your family's relationship with your friends because your family is only connected to your friends probably through you, okay? So clicks are these entirely, inter entirely connected subgraphs. Um, now, it is a nightmare problem to solve. Um, theoretically, they have an implementation in here that um, that solves it, but it's it's an NP complete problem. So on graphs of this size, um, it'll <laughs> take down even the uh, the mightiest of computers. So just be careful when you call this one because it uh, it can take some time to chug along. But what you get out of this is you actually get a you get a list of lists of all of the nodes that have a complete subgraph between them. And so you can start to go through and work out what the relationship is from looking at where all these tightly connected clicks are um, within an organization. So I'm sort of needing to wind up so that we can have some, uh, have a chat. Um, but I would, you know, uh, the documentation, the website for Network X um, is just Amazing! It's you know, as I said, it's really well supported. Um, their documentation pages are fantastic. Uh, go to the website um, and have a look. The functionality that's there is really well mapped out and really well categorized. So, you know, you can go and find your favorite algorithms, and you can drill down through. You know, they have a sort of they have classes of algorithms that find different things, and you can sort of drill into those classes, and then they have all of the API details and things like that. So, it's very very thorough. Um, and I have explained only a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction um, of the capabilities that this library has. So uh, I'd encourage you to go check it out. Um, so two other graph packages, which are totally unrelated to Python. 
uh, Gephi and Pagex. So Gephi I used to show you the earlier visualization. Um, it runs on all uh, all major platforms. Um, it's a it's a pretty good tool. It's a little, it's got a little bit of an issue with the current um, version of um, OS X, um, but they seem to be working on a resolution. But um, if you're pulling it down on a Mac, my tip is that if you run it out of the uh, the package rather than dragging it into your applications folder, it'll run. And um, why that is, I'm, it's a little bit beyond me, um, but I believe it has something to do with Java. So. Uh, and Pagex a Windows tool um, that does a similar kind of thing. So Gephi is a heaps more advanced version, but Pagex uh, does have some nice um, some nice properties, particularly around sort of graph generation and stuff. But it's only for Windows, and it's a few years old now. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's still worth checking out if you're interested in this kind of stuff. So my conclusion: graphs are good. Network X is awesome. Um, there's heaps of stuff you can do with it. Uh, you know, I've, as I said, I've really only scratched the surface, um, and there's lots of other cool things um, that are out there. Um, to you know, my um, my life's actually pretty much in big data, and while I've actually spent no time today talking about the relationship between data and uh, network X, um, data analytics and graphs are very very tightly intertwined. So, you know, there are probably things you can do with network X. There are definitely things you can do with network X that are beyond working out. Um, who is who has dodgy accounting practices. So I hope that's been useful. Thank you very much. And if there's any questions.